Okay. So we missed a lot there. I, I did a backdrop before I pressed the record button. So, uh, but we are recording now. So that was my mistake. I sometimes I forget. I had planned to do that, but I. Didn't. Okay. Thank you, Joe. So I mentioned the background of of what we that leads us into chapter six. There was a lot of. Uh, uh, distortion, abuse, money issues, people taking advantage of poor people, uh, corruption, false teaching. It's just people were worshiping God from an outward appearance, but inside they weren't. They had other idols. Uh, they wanted to worship the idols of the foreign countries and of the land. And God had provided them so much. You remember when he took them out of Egypt and brought them into the land of Canaan, they had houses and land already built, and they, they had plenty. They, they, the Lord had prospered them, and they were blessed, and all God wanted them to do was just be a light for him and uh, glorify him. Instead, they, got, they turned into the idols that were around, and they had, that's why God wanted to destroy all the people around them, because he knew the influence of those people would uh, draw them to their gods, their false gods. And so Isaiah is dealing with that today that we sometimes we don't uh, appreciate what God has done for us and, and sometimes we don't appreciate what people in the past have done to bring us to this point uh, so that we can continue worshiping God in, 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 um, in truth, in spirit and truth and in truth. Okay, so no comments there. So we start with the exploring the text uh, and it talks about God's glory. And this is from Isaiah 6 verse 1 through 4. The first verse says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. So to give you a little background drop there, um, Isaiah says when King Uzziah died, which was, he died in 740 B.C., Isaiah saw this vision. And Isaiah was a, a good king, Uzziah rather, I'm sorry, was a good king. He reigned for 52 years, but near the end of his reign, he became arrogant. Mm. Profaned the temple, uh, contracted leprosy, and died in shame. That's a sad way to go when you've been a good king for many, many years. And so he lets you know, I don't care how long you're walking with the Lord, if you're not careful, you will be filled with pride and, and, and have a way of... Uh, doing things that God is not pleased with. So but during his reign, Judah had a time of prosperity. The country had extended its boundaries, and the economy and, and general wealth of the people had increased. And the north, the kingdom of Israel had a similar growth during the reign of Jer Jeroboam II. Now, Jeroboam I was the one that started that separation and the kingdoms, northern kingdoms and southern kingdoms. I won't get into that because that's a little more in depth there. But the problem that was that both of the northern and the southern kingdoms forgot who had provided them with the wealth that they had possessed. The prophets of the time was Isaiah, Amos, and Hosea. They had long pointed out uh, the corruption, corrupt moral state of the people and how they had turned their backs on God in the midst of their prosperity. So Israel and Judah, there was a tendency to become self-reliant and morally lax during the time when physical needs were met in full. And as modern believers, we still face the same temptations. It's easy to, when things are going well, things, you, you have all your needs met, uh, the Lord has provided everything and uh, then we kind of kind of sit back and you know how you use the example want to just let your head down or want to lay back on the couch and just kind of relax nothing wrong with that but when it starts getting to the point where that's the most important thing uh, then there is a problem so verse 2 says the serpents were standing above him they each had six wings and with two they were covered they covered their faces and with two they covered their feet and with two they flew 
So the seraphims were six, with six wings had to cover their face because they couldn't gaze upon God's glory. Uh, in his vision, Isaiah witnessed God's holiness. Even though he was a prophet of God and a righteous man, he was made aware of his sinfulness uh, in his life. And the angels, also the angels in God's presence who were crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, covered their face, faces and feet with four of their six wings as an act of reverence and awe-inspiring by the immediate presence of God. And the seraphims stood covered as if concealing themselves as much as possible in recognition of their unworthiness in the presence of the Holy One. And if the pure and holy seraphim showed such reverence in the presence of the Lord, with what profound awe should we, polluted and sinful creatures, presume to draw near to him? The reverence shown to God by the angels should remind us of our own approach when we present ourselves to, in his presence. So any comments there before I get into verse 3 and 4? Uh, you have an opportunity to give uh, input. Um, again, we're talking about the holy and righteousness of God. And so um, when we think about that, you know, our creatures as sinful and polluted as we are, that we can, that God cares about us, you know, as holy as he is, that he, he cares enough about us that he would send his, Christ, his son, his only son, to die for us and sin. And even him, he was rejected in the whole in the world that he created, and he was rejected and pushed out of it. But thank God for that, because we needed him to go through that in order for us to have access to eternal life. So it's open for a comment. If you, anyone else have a comment, no comment. Yeah, there's one, uh, Deacon King. Good morning, uh, everyone. This is Sister Elaine. Um, I I just want to uh, get clearer understanding, but um, you know, if I if I'm wrong, the, but the holiness that is being referred to many times, um, persecution comes upon a person when. You spiritually, when you yourself were spiritually dead, and as God allowed you to, to uh, go along the pathway of life, and someone witnessed to you and awakened, uh, all of us are made of the spirit and the flesh. It's who we choose to submit ourselves to. So, whomever witnessed uh, to me. Uh, and awaken the spirit within me, and I then decided that I'm going to follow Christ, it's then about doing things according to what he has said in his word. That's how, and, and of course the whole process as I remain in this world, which is not my home, the Lord is, is working out of me uh, those things that are contrary to his image. And so at, in that result, that's how a person then grows toward uh, holiness. Uh, it's not your holiness, but the persecution comes when those who have not yet been awakened to the spirit that is within them and they're choosing to continue to lean to their own understanding and walk in their way because you can be uh, morally correct and uh, do everything that's right according to the law and all of that, uh, be a good, decent person. But we know the words say our best is as filthy rags because the only thing God looks at is our heart. And so if the heart is not right and I'm doing this good and perfect thing, to give that outward showing, that really means nothing. The holiness is talking about doing things God's way. And so many times the persecution will come 
because you are trying to live as God directed all of us to live in this world which is not our home. Uh, and and so um, this is probably what I believe Isaiah, um, when he recognized that, he recognized his sin, and when it, it's just something about when you recognize who you are, who really created you, and your purpose here in this life is getting busy discipling others to Christ, you are on the pathway. And if, if those whom you have been walking with can understand that, they then view you as trying to be holier than thou. It's not that. It's, it's knowing that one day I'm going to stand before the one who created me that's going to judge me and ask me, why did I do or didn't do when I was prompted to do by the Spirit, but I lean to the way of the world? No, I don't want to receive that kind of judgment. I want to be able to hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Right, yeah. You we see, thank you for sharing. This is a, we see that this is a, um, a, an inventory of individual and corporate uh, approach to to what God is trying to uh, get his people to see. And um, right, what you say is true. All of us have a, a, um, an opportunity and, and, and it's up to us. And we have to really do our own self inventory because we don't, uh, we look at our holiness and sometimes just what we see what holiness is like. And we don't open up our hearts sometimes to see, mm-hmm. God, how is your holiness? Ask him, how is your mm-hmm. holiness? How, how am I doing in my walk? Am I yeah. pleasing you directly? Not yeah. just everyone around us, but individually. Am I pleasing yeah. you? Am I honoring yeah. you in what I do? In my, in my, relationship with you in my uh, rea- surroundings in the church and what I do and the ministry that I'm in, is it glorifying you or is it yeah. honoring, puffing yeah. myself up? And so yeah. we have yeah. to deal with these things because only God really knows. And and, and, and sometimes he reveals it and sometimes it displays what we're exactly. really doing. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. the thing is, pride is so, is so, is so hidden that we don't even see yeah. ourselves yeah. Uh, prideful, and we think we are we are okay, and and mm-hmm. we haven't allowed God to really screen us or scan us. And some, mm-hmm. you know, our time we scan things. If God scans you. You you be you will come <laughs> short, and you will yeah. see areas in your life mm-hmm. that you need to improve. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Nobody's out here perfect. So the thing That's is, right. we don't. Uh, right. Sometimes we don't allow God to really. Uh, we don't go deep enough to allow God to expose his light on us and see how mm-hmm. sinful and awful we really are because we don't, we don't like that. We don't want to see that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So let's move on. Verse 3 and 4, it says, And one call to another, holy, 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 is the Lord, I like to say the Lord of hosts, but our Sunday school lesson used the Holmes uh, Christian Bible to say the Lord of armies. So his glory fills the whole world, the whole earth, rather. The foundations of the doorway should shook at the sound of their voices, and the temple was filled with smoke. So this, they saw a thrice invocation of the word holy uh, to describe God's sacred nature appears only two times in the Bible, and it's here in Isaiah 6, chapter 6, verse 2. And in Revelation 4, verse 8, both times it's spoken by angels to someone transported in the vision to the throne of God. And so there's only two times that it happened. And God's complete and supreme holiness is unmatched by anything or anyone else. And we we should never forget the glory and awe-inspiring presence of our God. That song that we sing, sometimes we sing it, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Uh, and and actually, actually I, I got a song that's a little, a little more, more contemporary, and, and I just wanted to play that and just reflect on God's holiness. And I'm going to take a few minutes of our time here to play this song, 
holy, 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 because it's, it, it, it kind of inspired me somewhat. Yeah, thank you. I can't imagine what Isaiah felt in his his in his uh, vision to the Lord. I mean, he was in the midst of God's holiness and His righteousness. And wow, I, I just really can't uh, even comprehend what he experienced when he was in the presence of God. So we see in verse five. This is God's, God's forgiveness. And we're moving on to God's forgiveness. Uh, it says, Then I said, Woe 
is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips. And this is what he experienced. And we, we really experience God's holiness. We, we, we see all of our uncleanness. It just opens up. You, you just can't. You, when you come into a presence of a holy and righteous God, your sin is going to show up. There's, there's no way. It, it's impossible for it not to. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. So with God's holiness and power, Right in front of him, Isaiah said, Whoa, it's me, for I am ruined. The nature of God's glaring, re glaringly revealed Isaiah's sinful state. And Isaiah thought he was going to die because he was a man of unclean lips. And lips, in this case, represents what comes out of the heart and reveals the inside and outside of a person. Isaiah continued to say, by saying his people were unclean as well. He knew his doom, and he would be doomed, and he would be the doom of the people, of his people. So a holy God and an unclean people cannot live together. And this was a problem that, that, exist, that had existed since the fall of humanity in the Garden of Eden. We cannot live an unclean life and come to a holy God and expect him to bless us. It, it just, the holy God and an unclean people cannot live together. God, we, if we really know that, understand the severity of sin, and, and sometimes, and I have to admit myself, I don't think I understand the depth of how difficult and how much God hates sin the depth of that to really we realize that we would try to avoid sin as much as possible and all costs as possible. So if anyone has a comment here before we go to verse 6 and 7, you can express mail. So I have a comment. This is Ed Allen. Mm -hmm. uh, we noticed that uh, once uh, the presence of God showed up for Isaiah, he acknowledged that that God was the supreme, almighty God, and he was in the presence of God. And at this point, nobody had to uh, drag the uncleanness out of him. He automatically acknowledged and submitted, as we have to do. Before God can work with us, we have to acknowledge and admit that <laughs> we are sinners and we are unclean. But nobody had to take a crowbar and pry that out of Isaiah. He admitted that the people and a lot of the things that they were doing, he probably had been a part of. So uh, before we can get clean, cleaned up, we have to acknowledge and submit. And then once he did that, the seraphim uh, touched his lips with hot cold and his sins was atoned. So uh, mm -hmm. that's one thing that popped out to me when I read these verses here. All right. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's true. We, 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 that's why we, it's so important for us to do individual self-analysis of our, of our individual selves because all of us are dealing with different things. Uh, it, it, all com it all comes together in, this, in, in the end, but we're dealing with different things in our lives in different times and different seasons. So thanks for sharing that. And so we'll move on to verse 6 and 7. It says, and, and, and you just spoke about it. He said, then one of the serpents flew to me, and in his hand was a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongues. He touched my mouth with it and said, now, this, then now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is removed and your sin is atoned for. Now, I know all of us can remember when we first accepted Christ. I mean, I had a wonderful experience. I, I felt light and... Uh, I, you know, I just, uh, it was like I had a whole brand new start. It, it just, everything was just so different. 
Uh, and um, as we move on in our walk with the Lord, I still like to have those uh, feelings of, of, of that lightness and that beautiful walk with the Lord. But sometimes it gets challenging as you go, go through this walk. Uh, and I think sometimes we embrace things that perhaps God is not t- telling us to embrace. And it, can, it, it may not be bad things. I'm not saying sin, but different things we get into. And, 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 and do, do we allow the Lord to lead us in the direction that he wants us to go into? Because sometimes we take on things that are, that are more heavier than that, that even God wanted us to do. But we end up doing things like that. So in response to Isaiah, one of the servants flew to, to Isaiah with a glowing coal to purify the, the prophet. And the coal was taken from the altar. The altar represented the sacrifice and purification of, from, from sin. And once Isaiah had been touched by the coal, he was ready to speak for God because his iniquity was taken away. And his sin was atoned for. Now he's able to stand in God's presence because of God's reaction. God's action on his behalf, not because Isaiah's action, but it's because God had removed his sin, and, and only God can remove our sins from us. In this scene, we see the foreshadowing of the gospel, both in Isaiah's human need for atonement and removal of sin, as well as God's grace. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. In Ephesians 2, 8 talks about that. So the question is, what events or circumstances in your life led you to realize you need to be forgiven for and atoned, forgiven and atoned for, rather? Anyone care to embrace that question? Um, okay. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, when I was a uh, I was a little boy, and we had a room in the house, and we were told not to go in there. And I'm seeing Isaiah being in a place where he didn't felt he deserved to be, because he had a confrontation there with the Holy God. Well, so one day right. I was in the house alone, and I tipped into this room, and I saw sheets covered stuff in 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 the room, so. I pulled up one of the sheets, and I saw a lot of Christmas toys. And at that moment, in my, myself, I said, oh, I'm dead. So I left that room, and, I, and, and, and my, my, uh, uh, in my mind, is, I can't say anything to anybody about this because <laughs> I'm doomed. And I, I think that was a lesson for me. And being obedient from that day on, you know, if my parents say, "Hey, don't do this, or don't do that," I listen. <laughs> yeah. And I had to, I, I, I had to seal my mouth from what right. I'd seen. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that 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 was a, that was an experience for me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that would have been. <laughs> Parents, if knew if your parents knew you were in there, I'm sure they would have uh, was really would be really upset with you. <laughs> Did they ever find out about it? Not for me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I can remember a time. I know when I I used to go to a church. As you all well know, I I went to a holiness church and. Um, uh, one time I was in there and uh, we were just praying like any other service and all of a sudden something just came about. I don't know what it was. Even to this day, I can't remember it. But everybody just started bursting out, praising the Lord. It was like the spirit that came over this this cloud that came over us. Everybody was glorifying the Lord. And, and, and it wasn't, okay, let's, you know, it wasn't man up there saying, okay, let's honor and glorify. Let's say hallelujah. You know how we, we, we do. We get people, come on, you know, he's been good. You clap your hands. And you, what, somebody mm. give a amen, amen. They didn't get any of that. It wasn't even expected. And everybody just started leaping out for joy, praising God, just naturally, spontaneously. And that mm. was just such a, a wonderful experience. And I realized that the Lord was just 
given us opportunity to glorify him and, and mm. honor him in that particular, in that particular service. And I, I haven't had that experience uh, since then. Uh, I, I mean, I get experience similar, kind of like that, but not into that depth that I that I experience. And uh, mm. people left just just so glorious. Everybody loving each other, hugging each other, hallelujah. You know, they just I, it, it was genuine. It was it really was genuine. Um, I have an example. Um, if it's appropriate. Um, you know, I got saved when I was about, um, must have been 25 and I'm 60 something. And I knew I was saved and I felt that I was living right. But really, I was saved, but I really didn't know the real meaning of what it meant to be saved and how powerful God was. And then I had a brain tumor. And uh, when I was getting ready to go in the hospital, no, getting ready to go into the operating room, um, the doctor says, well, um, you know, you may not be able to talk again or you may have slurred speech or something. So all of a sudden, first of all, I told him he didn't know what he was talking about. Second of all, when he left, I prayed so hard that I felt like I was in air. I did not feel the bed, and it was not because of the medication, because it hadn't really started yet. And I mm-hmm. put my hand down, and I did not even feel the bed. And the only thing I could say was hallelujah, mm. you know, because he is so powerful. And mm-hmm. okay, let me stop talking before I start crying. But anyway, I'm saying he is so unbelievably powerful. Things have yes. happened to me. Well, I didn't have money to pay my bills, and then all of a sudden in the mail I get a check for $2,000. You know what I'm saying? Things just happen when you try so hard to live right and to treat everyone else right. And um, I know that's not how you go to heaven, but bottom line is I've got so many examples of living proof. And, that, and when I told the doctor when, after I woke up, I didn't say a word. And he wanted me to say something to see if I could talk. I didn't hmm. say anything, you know, nothing at all. I did it on purpose, you know, because it wasn't a big deal because I know our Lord did this, not him. And um, hmm. it was just it was just amazing. I have never, I mean, I've had a lot of problems. I lost my husband, a whole bunch of stuff. But I have never felt, I mean, you know, God's power just comes it comes over you from your head to your toe, and he shows you things. He shows me things even before they happen, you know, um, with with my whole life. So that's just a kind of a testimony. I didn't want to get off the subject. Right. Thank you all for listening. Well, thanks for sharing. Yeah. That, that, that's a wonderful testimony. So we come to verse 8, and it says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord asking, who should I send? Who will go for us? I said, here I am. Send me. So in this verse, God spoke for the first time. Who should I send? And who will go for us? The question drew an eager response to Isaiah. And notice Isaiah's emotional response at this point in contrast to, the, to verse 55 where he was excited. Isaiah was in despair for his life because he recognized his sin before a holy God. Now having experienced both the holiness and forgiveness of God, he was eager to serve. After confession and forgiveness, the natural response is worship and service. Isaiah didn't wait to hear what past God had for him. He jumped at the opportunity to serve and call out, Here I am, send me. And so it doesn't stop by God's holiness and righteousness and hallelujah and all the blessings that he gives us. He wants us to serve him as well and worship him in spirit and in truth. So in verse 9 and 10, he replied, go, this is what God was saying, which is kind of unusual. Go say to these people, keep listening, but do not understand. Keep looking, but do not perceive. Make the minds of these people dull 
deafen the ears and blind their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their minds, turn back and be healed. Now, you know, go, wow, now, I'm, I'm, that would just uh, throw you off. And, okay, I'm confused here. God is telling him to do what now? You know, um, but what God was really saying was to go say to these people the truth, and that will cause them to stop their ears and to close their eyes and harden their hearts. Mm-hmm. Even when the truth even with the truth, they will continue to rebel. To, to, they will continue their rebellion and refuse to hear, see, or understand so that they, not, they might be healed. Now, I, I, that's just incredible. But sometimes we can get to that point where we will not even listen to truth. And, I, and they, were, they were so used to ignoring God's requirements that no amount of reminding would stir them to change their ways. Then we get an idea that seems shocking at first. This was the way God wanted it. He didn't want the people to turn back and be healed. And that's, that's mind-blowing there, too. But God knew that they would not hear or repent. He was simply telling Isaiah what he could expect from his prophetic work. Any repentance that people did make would have likely been superficial, and that was not what God wanted. Jeremiah, Jesus, I'm sorry, used the same thing, and in, uh, in, in, he used Isaiah's chapter 6, verse through 10 in his teaching. He cited these verses in Matthew 13, 14 through 15. While teaching the disciples about his use of parables, he told them that those who do not care enough to seek out the meaning behind the parables are like the ones Isaiah described who hear but do not really understand. Right. And that's, that's a mind blower there, and that's a lot there. But we can get to the point, if we walk in, in our Christian walk, we can get so comfortable in doing things the way we want that we don't really hear what God is speaking to us. And then when he does speak to us, we ignore it and think our way is right because we've been doing it so long like this. And um, we can be deceived. And, and that's the bottom line. If we don't keep nourishing our hearts, it was like the garden he was talking about. We have to keep pruning, cutting, uh, you know, coming back to the Lord, wanting more, you know, help from him, guidance from him, keep replenishing so we can, so the garden can be fruitful. Because if not, we, we will, in our own ways, we will make it unfruitful. Just man alone and he doing it his way and not God's way. It will become unfruitful. It will look fruitful to us. We will be deceived and think we're doing so much. Oh, we had a wonderful, blessed time in the Lord, didn't we? And uh, we may not have. It may be like that. But the next phase of his God's persistence in Isaiah 6, 11 through 13. Then I said unto the Lord. I'm, I'm sorry. Then, then, notice the change that Isaiah, when he found out this is what the Lord wanted him to say. Then I said, until when, Lord? And, and he replied, until cities lie in ruins without inhabitants. Houses are without people. The land is ruined and desolate. And the Lord drives people far away, leaving great emptiness in the land. Though a tenth will remain in the land, it will be burned again. Mm. Like the turbans of the oak that leaves a stump. When felled, the holy seed is a stump. A stump. So I was thinking about all the things we're going through. It's nothing like what Isaiah was thinking about. I was thinking about our land. You know, we have COVID. Uh, we have issues with injustice, Black Lives Matter, matter marches. We have fire burning in the West, and, 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 and it's beyond compatible thought. That, that, you know, it's, it's destroying more property than it ever have in, 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 in the time they've been having it. It's kind of annually they have these fires, but this one is, is, is the fire of fires, I guess you might say. Mm. And they have tornadoes and wipeouts, 
lands. You know, you, you think about all the destruction that has taken place in this in this year alone. You go, Lord, how much can we can we take as a country? You know. Um, so Isaiah kind of changed his tune. He was excited at first, and now he's like, Lord, until when? So he got to keep saying this over and over to the people until all these things happen. That's that's you, you begin to kind of feel a little, you know. Isaiah's earnestness to serve turned to discouragement, and he asked, until when, Lord? We can feel for him at this point, for no one wants to be continued. No one wants to continue a miserable task longer than they have to do so. Uh, it was also important to remember that Isaiah loved his people, and having his message rejected and being isolated as a result would be bring him emotional pain. And so while God answered, answer was not encouraging, neither was it completely without hope. Also, uh, he told Isaiah that, all, that almost complete destruction must happen before the punishment was finished. And mm. The description of the land without inhabitants and the city in ruins is stark and reflects the threat of destruction that God levels levels at the at the vineyard in chapter 5 he did the same thing to the vineyard but he just used that as an example of what he was going to do to Judah and Israel and Jerusalem those who would survive the destruction of the land would be carried away in exile to complete the purification of the land and after these events only a tenth of the former population would remain and that tenth would suffer yet more judgment Yet just when all seems lost, God gives Isaiah cause for hope. He described the people of God as the stump of the felled oak tree. And while it appeared dead, it still had life in it. And from that stump, a seed of life would germinate from a remnant. The people of God would be renewed. So the question is, when have you found it difficult to remain faithful because there seems to be no hope of change? What enabled you to keep trusting God? Hmm. And that was a difficult time Isaiah had to go through to see. Uh, I don't know if he lived to see all of that happen. Because Jeremiah was, was in the midst of all of that. He, Jeremiah saw all that come to pass. But I don't know if Isaiah actually saw that. But he, he was revealed that that would, would take place. And so it must have been very difficult for him to know his people was going to be, uh, most of the people would be, be destroyed. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what the, uh, this is Ed Allen again. I'm, I don't know whether uh, whether Isaiah realized when he said, send me God, that he was going to have a Noah's Ark moment here where it was going to be a purging, and he had to deliver the message on a continuous basis. Uh, but just like you said before, the people were serving superficially. And when when he gave them this message, anybody that changed their tune and started serving God at that, at that point, that would also have been superficial in God's eyes because, because he would, would, would have known that they were only changing to, to uh, subvert their own demise. So uh, I'm sure that's how God, God was thinking too, you know. But uh, mm -hmm. I don't think that was the the picture that that came with the first uh, the first encounter with God. He was excited, as you say, and then he said, "Oh yeah, send me." And then he found out what he had to do. You know, hey, well, oh boy, <laughs> it's the Noah's Ark moment here. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, well, what have yeah. you found difficult in your own life that uh, that to remain faithful to God under difficult circumstances and what enables mm. you to keep trusting. Cause there've been points where uh, I have to admit in my life, sometimes 
if I if I go on too long, I have to catch myself and realize that the enemy is trying to deal with my heart. But some situations can say, Lord, you know, this seems hopeless, and 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 I, especially when you've gone through losing a loved one, and uh, I remember when I lost my mother, and and, and lost, uh, and almost one time thought I was going to lose my daughter in, in her pregnancy. You know, those were difficult times, and I, Lord, really, how you know, please help help me to handle this and, and enable me to trust you, and 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 he 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 just. It wasn't right away, but he just did things that 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 showed me, reassured me that he was in control of all of it, and I just rested in his hands because he had reassured me uh, that everything was going to be okay. This is a moment to trust me, and I and I realized I had to put my trust. There was no other hope, and no other place that I could turn to, mm. and I knew that if he didn't help me through this, no one else would have. And, and and that really that really blessed me and, and it helps me even when I go through difficulty now, knowing that it, it may not sometimes it may not seem that God is there, but He truly is. And when it, when that time that moment that I'll put that right time that moment He'll come in and and minister to His people and and, and that, that that encouraged me so much, so much. Mm. It was just powerful the way He did that. I mean, but when you take time, we got two minutes over. I'm sorry. Go ahead. We have to take one more comment. We got to close out because we we went over time. Go ahead. Okay. Um. Think about this COVID nineteen. I mean, you know, you have right. you have no. You have to. The only thing you can do is believe in God because this is just. It's like there's no ending. You know, people are getting depressed, anxious, everything. But only thing with myself, the only thing I can do is just pray, and pray and pray and. You know, um, one of my neighbors asked me, how come you look at spiritual um, stuff on uh, on TV early in the morning? I said, you don't know I need this. Mm-hmm. You know, because this mm-hmm. is really, this is such a hard time. Mm-hmm. It, but then I think about how they say um, things, I don't know the exact, uh, the exact verse when they say things will fall to your left and to your right, but it won't touch you. I mean, I think about that too. Okay, well, anyway, I'll finish. Oh, go ahead. Somebody, somebody, somebody. I don't I'm know what that was. Don't close my trunk. That's not, that's not really what we want to hear right now. We wanted to hear what you were talking about. <laughs> but anyway, we do have to close up. So thank you for that, that testimony. I don't know what's going on now. We got some kind of somebody interfering in our, in our, in our time of, of uh, Sunday school. I, just, I, I, I wanted to thank Sister for that comment. I just want to thank that sister for that comment. Only, only to say that I, that's the same thing that I'm doing is praying and praying and, and literally we serve the, we see things in the natural, but God is a supernatural God and we just have to keep getting in his word. And that's what's going to keep us. When you get down, when you get depressed, go, just, just go to his word. Pray with a friend. Keep yourself encouraged. And, and, and I think, and I want to thank that sister for, re, and I just want to reiterate that because we need that right now more than everything that is to stay in prayer and connection with God. Thank oh, you. This is Teresa, too. I'm sorry. I didn't see who I was. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Amen. All right. Amen. We have to close out here. We are about five minutes over now. So let's look to the Lord. Thank you, Father, for this time together. Pray that your Holy Spirit will fill with our feet. Man, I guess I was wrong Lord. for asking a question of where to bring the food at. Did nobody respond? No, we and we will trust you, Lord, in the midst of all these difficulties that we're going through. So I ask this in Christ's name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Amen. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye. Deacon King. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Yeah. Everybody. Okay. Deacon, Deacon King, do you take role? Do I take mm-hmm. role? Yeah, do you mark down who's present and who's absent? No, but uh, 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 conferencecall.com keeps a tab of how many people come in, in and oh, out. Okay. And just, oh, they list okay. their emails, their address, and things like whatever, whatever, whatever they use. But I don't keep tabs of that things like that. They let me know okay. how many people come in. Uh, They'll let okay. you know that. 
Uh-huh. And I actually have to No, I just didn't know whether she, uh, you were speaking earlier, and she said, uh, let yourself, let them know who's here. And I thought, no, but Myra Hayes is the one doing the talking. But that's okay. Yeah, Thank I you. Know, I recognize you. 